Right, so um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, processing uh, event cameras. And I, I come from a uh, systems and control background originally. Uh, and so that's uh, influenced very much the way we've gone into what we're doing. Um, this is just to show you some of the uh, results that we're getting. So image reconstruction, some work on image gradients, computing optic flow and feature tracking. Um, but the, the interesting part isn't so much what we're doing, but how we're doing it. So I wanted to put this slide up um, first, just to motivate what we're doing. We're interested in embedded systems, and particularly we're interested in uh, being able to do complex robotics with, with vision. So the way we're, we're looking at doing this at the moment, we're using this Ultra 96 hardware. Um, and the nice thing about that is that we actually have access to an FPGA in an integrated way. So the Ultra 96 board has the FPGA, it has a, uh, um, a shared memory uh, block that we can access from the FPGA, from the processing, from the CPU, the real-time CPU, and from a GPU. Um, but what we're actually trying to do is we're doing pretty much all of the um, uh, event processing on the FPGA, which leaves us most of that board free to do the high-level computing, to, to do path planning, to do um, semantic understanding of scenes and such like using the GPU. So the interesting thing here is really how can we do this, um, this basic image processing from events in a really um, sensible way. And so this is uh, the FPGA architecture, and I'll talk a little bit more about the mathematics, but the idea is that we get events in, uh, we timestamp them, and then we've got these very simple operations that we can, we can run. Um, but reminiscent of Andy's comment about the IPUs and stuff, it's, it's really super important that we have access to the image state um, sort of in real time. And so events, because they're asynchronous, you can't be affording to read and write into memory. So you need to have these architectures where, where everything's available to you, the same as Piotr's talk. Um, and so that's, that's how we're trying to, to do this processing. So the rest of the talk, what I want to do is just introduce you a little bit to the approach and then just show you how we can do some of the things we're doing. So an event camera, the same as everyone else has been talking about, uh, yields events, so you get this sequence of, of uh, spikes which uh, give you a pixel location, a timestamp and a polarity. And um, the point I want to make about that is that this actually uh, has some aspects of continuous time in it as well as some aspects of discrete to time. So if we want to think about the way, or the way I think about an event, we have a, uh, a function here which um, describes the pixel location and the polarity. And that, that part of the event is uh, a function of discrete variables. So it's a function of the, the pixel locations and, and, a, and a discrete variable. But an event stream also contains a timestamp. And so if we actually think about the event stream here, um, it's the, the product of that, that discrete information along with the Dirac delta function. And a Dirac delta function, of course, is a, a function of a continuous time variable. And so the point here is that uh, events are very, very different from a traditional camera in the sense that they have this dependence on continuous time variable. They're not a continuous time signal, but they are a continuous time uh, system. So they're not continuous, but they are a continuous time signal, I guess is the point that I wanted to make. So this actually led me to start thinking about um, processing events in terms of uh, systems and continuous time systems interpretation. So if we go to the very basic concept of image reconstruction and you think about how would you go about rebuilding an image uh, from an event stream, so uh, direct integration, which has been around since, since events were, were first put together, so you want to create an estimate of the, the log intensity of your, your image and you simply sum up all the other events that have occurred in that particular image. And if you think about um, what that is in terms of the Dirac Delta, it's just taking the continuous time integral of that, that um, continuous time signal that, that I was talking about. And so I can write that, um, if you remember back to your, your uh, uh, bachelor degree engineering where you would all, all would have done the systems and control course, you can write it in a transfer function representation as just an integration process. Now, Direct integration of these sensors, of course, yields a very, very noisy signal, as we all know. And so this is an example of what you get from direct integration and the fact that 
every time you, you add up all the events, you get noise, and then that noise uh, is locked in the pixel, right? Because you're not replacing the pixel, and so that, that noise gets integrated into the pixels and it, and it destroys your scene. So why don't we just filter the noise out? So as David has said right at the start, a, a, um, an event camera is a high-pass sensor, right? So really it's only giving you high-pass information anyway. So in my systems theory representation, I can simply stick a high-pass filter in and have a look at what the result is. And so this is, this is the result you get. Um, and it's not doing a bad job of doing... Um, image reconstruction from events, right? So it's getting rid of all of that low frequency noise. Obviously, you have to pick the, um, the roll off frequency correctly to figure out what you're doing. And there's a few artifacts in there, the shadowing, the bright lights at the end, which I can talk a little bit more about later. But it's, it's actually quite an efficient way of getting your hands on some information in a very simple way. All right, how do we actually build a high pass filter, right? This is just a, a state space representation at the moment. So in systems theory, we, we deal a lot with these feedback loops. And so a very simple feedback loop can be used to synthesize or to realize such a high pass system. And so if we think about that systems diagram at the top here, you're feeding events in as effectively as a, as a disturbance input into a control system. They're going through the integrator, and then the, uh, the loop recovery there is giving you the, the, um, the one on S plus alpha uh, dynamics of the, of the system. So the, um, the transfer function realization there, we think about it as integrating the events. So they, the events come in, they go through the integral, and then they go around the loop, which gives you the, the high pass, the high pass um, filtering. So the nice thing about this then is that we can write down that, um, that conceptual um, image processing uh, pipeline, which is integrate and then high pass filter. You can write it down as a very simple first order ordinary differential equation at the bottom there. Now, and of course, that ordinary differential equation has state, right? So it has an internal uh, image state that you need to, to maintain at, at all time. All right, so once you've written down the high pass and you look at that, then immediately you say, well, well what about the, the other uh, standard input for a control system? So what happens on that uh, left spot there where I've put a Y uh, entry into the system? And so this is the other place that you, you generally get an input. And um, so if I just imagine that I've got a signal there, which is uh, an estimate, in this case, a direct estimate, maybe attained from, from the raw image from a Davis camera or similar, uh, what happens if I put that in and then I get the transfer function realization of, of, that, uh, of that system and I get a very simple ordinary differential equation that realizes that. And the nice thing about this is this, um, this system is in the form uh, known as a complementary uh, sensitivity representation of a, of a control system. And in particular, if your Y and your, the integral of the E events, so if I integrate the E events here, and that's approximately the, the true signal, which it should be at least at high frequency. And if my Y is approximately the true frequency, at least it is at low frequency, uh, then if I actually plug those into the transfer function realization, you get this um, complementary sensitivity property, which means that you recover exactly the signal that you're putting in. So effectively, this gives you a way of fusing low frequency information in the Y, high frequency information in the events, and rebuilding uh, the full frequency information of the, of the output. All right, but to do this, I still have to realize a... Um, an ordinary differential equation, so something that runs in, in real time or in continuous time. So that's that ordinary differential equation that I've just drawn up at the top. Um, but the sort of the, the novelty of the work, I guess, that, we're, the, that I'm presenting is this idea that you can realise that um, through explicit integration of the, of the ordinary differential equation. And so there's two things that happen in this ordinary differential equation. One is the period of time in between events, and one is what happens when an event arrives. So if we think about a period of time in between events, and we think about this Y signal, which is effectively low frequency, and so what I'm going to do is assume that that 
that Y signal is constant, which actually where our original sort of implementation was from the Davis camera, where it's actually a constant uh, readout from the raw frame, uh, is a very natural assumption. So as long as that's uh, made, then you can actually integrate that equation on the top. There's no events in that period, so you forget about the E, and I just solve that e equation explicitly, and I get this, um, this update equation, which tells me how to basically take my continuous time event state from time TK to time TK plus one. So when an event comes along, I also consider integrating the ODE, but now I effectively integrate it from just before time tk plus 1 to just after time tk plus 1, and it's a direct delta function, so what happens is effectively it just does uh, an, an event update of the state. So this gives me a way of exactly implementing, for an event stream at least, the ordinary differential equation which is at the top there, and I can do it. Uh, it's an asynchronous update, so you only compute this when an event arrives or if you want to read out the circuit, read out the information. Uh, it's very computationally efficient. It has only the single exponential uh, scalar exponential to compute. And it gives you this access to this image state. And so the, the, the thing that's really novel in the whole work is this concept that what we're doing is we have a continuous time image state embedded in the, the processing uh, pipeline that we're doing here. We don't necessarily compute it for every possible time, but whenever we want to read out the image state, a very sim simple set of computations gives us the value of the image state at the time t. It's a continuous time uh, object that we're actually processing. So this is really a continuous time processing framework. Um, all right. So the results that we get out of it here. This is um, uh, some results drawn from uh, driving at night. Um, and so it's taken with the Davis 240C camera. You can see on the left-hand side the raw output. So the top frame is the standard output from the camera. The bottom frame there is the events that we're reading off. Um, and the top right is the full complementary filter. So it's taking the low frequency information from the frame. It's taking the events and it's computing an output at whatever the readout rate that you want to um, display the data at. Uh, here, this is a case of a person running in front of a car at night, so you can see there's almost no information in the, in the uh, raw frame, and so what you're computing here is the information from the events, and you can see that the background information from the raw frame is not represented when you, when you don't put it in. So es essentially, when we run this, we set the, uh, the slow information to, uh, to zero. And you can see the, uh, the dynamic range, the advantages in the dynamic range of the, of the events in that. Uh, this is all open source code. So what can you do? Now the basic idea is there. So what other cool things can you do? And I'll just set my, uh, my video running here. So this is one thing that you can do, which is just a trivial little um, additional trick to this. So cameras like Davis cameras, um, they have things called hot pixels, and you can sort of see it in the very top uh, image. I don't know, do we have a, a pointer? If you've got a pointer, I can... There's a hot pixel just about there. It's a pixel that's always bright, if you can sort of see it there. And so there's another one down here, okay? So this is something where there's a problem with the, the synthesis of the circuit, and so this pixel's firing all the time. Um, so we can get rid of that, and what's more, we can also... Um, use a, uh, a methodology to actually identify um, and, and adapt the calibration of each pixel. And so this is this idea here where we're just adding a very simple um, integrator into the system. And so if, if, this was, if I was talking about this as a control system, I'd be talking about going from a proportional gain to a proportional integral gain. And I set this, um, this bias, this alpha here, to quite a small value. So the integral is averaging over a lot of time. And in this case, it averages over around about two or three minutes um, to really converge the state. And what that does is it takes all of the data that's gone through that pixel over the last 100 seconds or 200 seconds, and it makes an estimate of what the actual value of the pixel is. And if you look carefully here into the bias state, you can see the hot pixels starting to come out. Okay, so the fact that that pixel is firing all the time is being picked up by my, my integral term in my, in my filter 
and uh, being subtracted out of the, uh, the final result. Okay, you can also see, it might be hard to see, but there's a little bit of texture showing up actually in the, uh, in the image in the bias state as well. And that's the noise which is actually in the images. And it's a little bit hard to tell in, in any one of these sequences, but actually you can tell by the end of this sequence that the noise, there's, there's still shadowing and such like in the reconstruction, but it's much more even. It's, it's had a lot of the, um, the variation in the pixel by pixel variation taken out. So very simple application of this general filtering theory. Um, again, pixel by pixel, very, very simple to implement. Here's another thing that we can do. We can compute image gradients. So, so what is an image gradient? And here it's all done in the log, the log intensity. So if I take my image output at a fixed time t, and I simply run an image convolution across that, then I'm going to compute a gradient image. So let's, on the left here, look at a realization of that as a systems theory. So I've got my complementary filter here running as I wanted, and I simply run the output of that through my convolution process, spatial convolution, and I would get a gradient image. But convolution is linear, and my system is linear, so I can take that convolution and I can pull it through the, um, through the linear system and, uh, and convolve the input to the system and simply generate a system that, uh, that outputs the gradient directly. What's more, in a typical image, most of the pixels are zero gradient most of the time. And so I can take this part of it and say, well, I might as well assume that the, uh, that the gradient is zero. And, uh, and then really all, I'm, all I've got to do is compute convolutions of events, stick them into my filter, and, uh, and I should get something that looks like an image. So let's just think about taking um, an event and convolving it. So here you imagine a, a Sobel kernel, so my gradient kernel on the far left, and I'm going to have an event occurring at some location UKVK. In this case, it's a negative event. So what happens when I convolve an event with my kernel is I generate a whole new set of events, one event for every element, non-zero non element of the kernel, um, and they all occur at the same timestamp TK. So I basically, I multiply the number of events I need to deal with um, but they're all occurring roughly at the same time, time stamp. And so I get this new little collection of events, which again can be cascaded down into the, uh, into the pixel by pixel computation. Um, so I, I wanted one of Pieter's uh, cameras as soon as I can get one, but I'll, I'll be writing to him later. So from doing that, you get these very nice, very nice images where you can compute gradients. So uh, in real time and, uh, and operationally. All right, once you have a gradient, of course, you, you would like to compute optic flow. So this is, uh, this is an algorithm that computes optic flow. So we go to the constant brightness assumption, uh, which is the standard, standard information about of, uh, optic flow that we have. And on the left-hand side of this, of course, we get the time derivative uh, with the pixel locked. So it's a partial derivative with respect to time. So we can approximate that by uh, when an event occurs divided by the delta timestamp since the last event. And the right-hand side here, we can compute our gradient information that we got. And then we can make an estimate, and here I've called it phi n, of the normal component of the optic flow. So this isn't the, the well, it is actually the optic flow in a sense, right? Because it's the actual change in the image intensity, but it's not the actual motion of a point. It's, it's only the... Uh, motion perpendicular to the edge information in the image. Nonetheless, it's the, the basic information that's available. So this information, of course, is not derivative of the information we want. It's actually uh, equal to the information we want. So instead of putting it in before the integrator, we need to enter it into the system after the integrator. And this is where a standard sensitivity disturbance goes into a control system still works perfectly well, right? We can still take this information, plug it into one of our, our systems, read out the output here, and we still have this opportunity to put something in on the left-hand side. And this is going to go in at low frequency, this is going in at high frequency, and of course what we'll put in there is a regularization term. So something to average optic flow locally and to implement some of the standard regularization terms that people, people would want to implement. And so using that, uh, we get um, quite, quite reasonable optic flow uh, calculation out. Um, again, this is color-coded, 
and again you can see that it's primarily picking up where ed edge information is because of the, uh, the, the driving term which is associated with the edge information. Um, and we've got a reasonably, reasonably aggressive alpha in here. Am I going two minutes? Yep, last, last two slides. All right, so another thing that we're interested in doing is um, actually um, integrating all of this into a uh, you know, SLAM pipeline or at least being able to understand features. So here is a very first cut at doing uh, some feature tracking. This is some work that actually is only about two weeks old. Um, and it's fairly basic at the moment, right? So I'm, I'm wanting to go quite a lot further on this. But let's imagine that instead of trying to count events and do something, we just want to go back to basic feature tracking and we want to use Harris features. So how do you compute Harris features? You uh, take gradient information and typically the Harris matrix is comprised of gradient, gradient transpose. So it's a two by two matrix. And then you compute uh, matrix M and you compute uh, the determinant divided by the trace, or you compute the determinant minus plus uh, minus a gamma trace squared, but something like this. Um, and this gives you a response, which is a scalar response, and the maximums of that response are where corners occur in the image. So um, we, we've done this. Um, here's the actual image here, and you can see the, um, the Harris response uh, that we're getting out of uh, this. Of course, it's noisy, as you would expect. And what we're doing here is a very first cut at, um, at feature tracking. So we've got a little um, velocity estimator and then we pull out the maximum of the Harris, the Harris um, information and then track it. And this is at 20 hertz. So there's a couple of interesting things here. One is it, it works remarkably well and it actually is replicating uh, traditional image processing type ideas. Um, this part of the... Uh, of the computation is linear, right? So I can compute that directly in a term, but actually once I compute this M matrix, I'm, I'm taking a nonlinear product of, of objects. And once you take a nonlinear product, you can't implement everything in terms of this linear uh, filtering theory that I was doing. So it's an interesting example where here we need to update the Harris response uh, every time there's an event and then when we're doing the tracking we need to actually here do a local a local linear search and there's some ideas I have to to improve that but nonetheless it's it's a it's a nice little algorithm and it shows that this stuff can be done uh, locally very effectively and so I've got 30 seconds left in my talk so just a, a thank you to everyone <laughs>